Welcome everyone to the Growing Food Here um, webinar. Um, I wanna start with just a few housekeeping details. And then I just wanna um, do a really quick introduction and say that this is a part of the Eat Local project, um, which is sponsored by the Cochise County Library District. And we have a number of components to this program. We have a school kit, we have a ton of great resources at all of our um, libraries in Cochise County, um, books, display materials. We've got a website, a directory of local farmers markets and local producers. Um, so check out those materials. In the email you got, um, there's links to that. And we will also be sending an email after this webinar that has a recording of this session, as well as um, links to a lot of the resources we're gonna talk about. So I want to just do a quick introduction of who's here with us. We have a really great panel this evening, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. My name is Karen Fassenpower, and I'm the project manager for the Eat Local um, project for the Cochise County Library District. We also have um, Bill Cook with us, who's the program coordinator for U of A in Greenlee County Cooperative Extension. And Bill is my go-to expert for all things growing here. Um, he has been a real um, mentor of mine and somebody that I've, I've relied a lot on. Um, we also have Eric Hess, who's the managing director of Dragoon Range Farms. And Eric, uh, Dragoon Range Farms, which is in Wilcox, um, Eric has over 30 years of experience in agriculture. He grew up on a family farm. He worked in, as a research scientist for BASF for a number of years. And he now runs Dragoon Range Farms, which focuses on producing produce and livestock in a healthy and sustainable manner. And then we have Jan Groth, who is the Master Gardener Instructor from U of A Cooperative Extension in Cochise County. And we're happy to have her. So we have a great panel. Um, we're gonna jump right in with some questions. And we're going to start with um, just what should I plant and when? And I'm gonna I'm gonna let um, Bill Cook lead us off with this. And again, as you have your own questions, put them in Q and A per, uh, participants, and we'll get to those. Bill. All righty. Well, you know, down here in our part of the world, we're pretty fortunate. We can grow something all year. You know, we do pretty well here. Um, we have two cool seasons actually, and one fairly long main season. So we're in a pretty good, good situation here. Um, to me, what's the big difference is uh, the cool season crops, which I have found the cool season garden to actually be uh, more reliable, more, more consistent. Uh, last year is a great example. We had three heat waves that just about time things were starting to produce, here comes another heat wave, knocks them down, and just about the time they recover, here comes another one. Whereas uh, the cool season is pretty good. Now we're looking at a, a calendar here, and you'll notice that there's some pretty broad ranges in that calendar, you know, like uh, asparagus, vegetable species, the 3,000 to 4,500, February 15 to April 1. That's a pretty broad uh, time period. And, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll find that we'll do a lot better. We can narrow that down because what's maybe a February 15 for Jan might be closer to the April 1 for me. So the big question is, how do we determine that, you know? What, what constitutes the beginning and the planting time of our season. So if we can go to that calendar wheel. So let's just, let's just look at this wheel. Let's go over here to springtime, the left quadrant. And you'll see there, there on the top, there's uh, little notes tell you what each ring is for. Root growth, soil temperature, air temperature, top growth and water requirements. So if we go over there to the springtime in our soil temperatures, you'll see we're coming out of winter with the shaded blue cool temperatures. And then you'll see where we get into that kind of orangey shaded where it says warm 
soil temperatures. So the next ring is the air temperature. If you look again, coming out of winter into spring, you'll see that the air temperature is warming up more rapidly and, at, and to a higher degree than the soil temperature. That makes sense? We follow in there? Yeah, okay. So take something like romaine lettuce um, that when the temperature hits 90 or low 90s, it gets bitter and nasty and bolts. So if we're, we go back to that soil temperature, we'll see that by the time the soil temperature is getting up in the warm enough temperature range to plant the lettuce, and then we shift right over to the air temperature and we follow air temperature around, we see that that air temperature becomes hot most likely before our lettuce is mature. So what, what this is illustrating is how when the soil temperature warms up enough, you're not too far away from an excessive air temperature. So spring gives us a fairly short uh, cool season, but we come right across to the other side in the fall and as the soil cools, the air has already begun to cool. So by the time we hit that uh, good, good germination temperature for the lettuce, we have the air is beginning to cool off instead of heat up, which then gives us a longer growing season. And of course, a lot of things here with just a small amount of protection will go through the winter. And uh, one thing that I have found that I like to plant in the fall, you know, on, on specifics is uh, Brussels sprouts. Because with just a little bit of mulch and a little bit of protection, they'll come through that winter and you'll get a, you'll get a, you'll get a fall picking and a spring picking and the spring picking will be just magnificent. So, these are kind of the decision factors when we plant something. What is, the, what is the soil temperature for those seeds? What is the air temperature? And which direction are temperatures growing? Going, which basically is a formula for how much uh, growing season we have left. So in the spring, I like to plant the really short season, the real quick lettuces and stuff. Uh, in the fall, I like to plant the things that take a little bit longer. So that's, that's how the soil and the air temperatures work together. Can we go back to the germination temperatures? Yeah, boy, I wish I could get this. I'm going to try one more time to get. You had a little, a little pencil that was on the screen over on the Oh, was it? Side. Yeah. I think that was me. Oh, that was oh. Karen. Okay. Sorry. I saw it. Okay. There. <laughs> yeah. I, so, this is, it's okay. so, Bill, for people who are, who are new to growing, what would you, what's good to plant right now? Okay. And again, are you in Portal? Are you in Sierra Vista? Are you in Duncan? Um, if you're in a place where your soil temperatures are, are favorable to planting, say, lettuce, uh, this is what the tail end of March, April, May, um, where I live, you get up by the end of May, you're passing 90 very consistently. So, you know, I've got two months, uh, 60 days here. So I would be inclined to plant uh, the leaf lettuces that I can begin using very early. If I had started plants ahead of time, um, there's a chance, you know, if I had some like 30 day old uh, cabbage seedlings, you could pull off some cabbage now. And of course, come fall, you'll have a lot better luck with these various things uh, because by the time your soil temperature and your air temperature come together, you've got an extended period of cool weather because Starting your seeds when the soil is warm, once that plant has rooted out, it'll grow in cooler soil. 
you know, it'll grow in warmer soil, but this, this will grow in cooler soil is an advantage in the fall. Um, another benefit to planting in the fall is that a little touch of frost, I think, really improves the flavor of a lot of things. So if we go here to this chart, and we'll come down here to say Swiss chard, and we're looking at the minimum temperature for Swiss chard is 50, the range is 50 to 85, optimum is 85, and when your soil temperature gets over 95, you're pretty much out of luck, you're wasting seeds. Um, so when you're comparing your soil temperature to your remainder of your growing season, you'll find that that shard, you could plant that the first of September usually, you know, or the middle of September for sure, because the monsoons have come along. Clouds in the afternoon, the soil is, is much cooler. But then we come down here to, oh, let's, Follow down, where's lettuce? So lettuce, you've got that 75 degree optimum. That's 10 degrees cooler. In the fall, you would be planting it a little bit later. In the spring, you would be planting it a little bit sooner. Um, you know, and the, you know, I stress soil temperature above a calendar date for a number of reasons, beginning with that you know, there's, there's microclimates everywhere. And the other thing is that if your plant is coming up slow, if it's dragging its feet to come up, well, it's gonna drag its feet to establish and it's gonna drag its feet to finish. Um, the, the quicker you can get that plant out of the ground, the healthier it's gonna be from, from the very start to the very finish. And some things, you know, it's like for years before I ever put it together, I used to wonder why is it some years my okra comes up really good and some years it doesn't? Because I always plant it on Cinco de Mayo, right? That's just what I've always done. That's my, that's my planting weekend. And uh, I started using a soil thermometer because uh, okra likes 95 degrees to germinate. And I realized some years I have 95 degrees on Cinco de Mayo and some years I don't. And once I started planting by the thermometer, there's been a lot of years, it's been the first of June, but I had a better crop than the raggedy crop that I planted the early, early in May. So, um, you know, I encourage everybody to use that chart and use that soil thermometer. And well, we're seeing temperatures changing with time too. So yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah and yeah, you know, yeah. and there are some just good old reliables, you know, like if I was new to gardening and I could give me one piece of advice, it would be root crops, beets, carrots, onions, those things, they'll take a, a, a cold snap or a, or a short heat wave without the damage that a tomato or a pepper, you know, that sort of thing does. They're very, very tolerant of, of the little fluctuations, not to mention the fact that they're extremely productive and they're easy to grow. You know, root crops are the easiest thing in the garden as far as I'm concerned. Bill, do you that think there's time to plant them now? For people that are new, is it, is it a good time to try to plant the root cups right now? Well, I, again, I would go to that soil temperature chart. But there's time and, for them uh, to cure. Yeah, and you know, Wait, and another, Oops. A, another thing is don't necessarily wait for optimum germination temperature. If you look there, you'll see like uh, beets, they'll germinate from 50 to 85. 85 is the optimum, but you know, if, if it's 70 or 75, what the heck, what's a few seeds? Um, and, and I plant real heavy and do a lot of thinning because, you know, maybe, maybe the, the raggedy plants from planting it into too cool of a soil, you know, there's a few of them are kind of scruffy. Well, thin them out because there's always those ones that are booming that are real darn happy. 
So, you know, that's if I was a new gardener, the other best advice to myself would be plant heavy and thin. Not to mention, you know, it's like I pulled up, a, I don't know, a colander full of uh, mixed, you know, beets and chard and carrots and stuff. And heck, I just threw it right in the salad. Just, you know, wash the dirt off and away you go. So it's, uh, it's a good thing. And thinning can compensate for a lot of garden error. Overplanting and thinning is, is kind of almost guaranteed success. <laughs> and always better to overplant than underplant. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure we've all had this experience where you're planting, you know, cucumbers or carrots and you stick an open pack in your pocket and you bend over and you get like about a hundred seeds in one little spot of your garden. And then you notice later what comes up the biggest and the bushiest and the fastest. I mean, has anybody else ever had that experience where there's just this little jungle comes up where you had a spill? Um, you know, because seeds do benefit from, from some neighborly competition as far as getting up and going and all that. Oh, this darn phone. There. Interesting. Okay, so just in the interest of time, I'm going to go yeah. to our next question, which is about where to plant. And this is especially for new people who are thinking, do I need a greenhouse? And this is a question I get a lot. Should, you know, can I plant right in the ground, containers? So I'm going to let um, Jan handle this question and just a brief, some of the pros and cons of different places to plant. Sure. And anybody that wants to chime in, I, um, I mean, Eric or Bill, you know, chime in any time. But I, I think a lot of this has to do with your property and what you have available to you. So some people really enjoy planting in the ground. The advantage to the ground is a, a lot of space, number one. Uh, number two, you get the advantage of the, it's like a community of microorganisms, um, the mycorrhizae and all the other organisms that live in the ground. It's a community that's actually very, very healthy and can be um, very supportive for your plants. But on the, by the same token, some people don't have a ground that they can really dig in. They don't have a lot of property. Um, and getting something started in the ground is a lot of work. The biggest thing you can do is loosen that soil and add organic material. If you do nothing more than just add a lot of organic material, that will really, really help. So there's more preparation in the ground. I love growing things in containers because I can control my soil. I can control the water. I can control the fertilization of it. And um, it's, it's just... For me, it's, it's a lot easier, although I do have in-ground vegetables as well. So raised beds are a wonderful way to garden. Um, they're, they're good for your back, actually, because you can reach them a little bit more. Again, you can control soil and fertilizer and water a little bit better than you can in the ground. Um, people ask, I know I get people that ask about greenhouses a lot. I don't Personally, I don't know if Bill and Eric feel this way, but I don't personally feel that a greenhouse is necessary for anything unless you're trying to start seeds early and you're trying to get seeds started in the winter for a spring planting. Then you may need the protection of a greenhouse. But a greenhouse is a lot of work. Um, you, you've got to maintain the right humidity. So, so in other words, once we get warm or through the summer, there's no reason to have a greenhouse because then you're constantly trying to cool it. You're trying to make sure that the humidity levels are right and temperatures are correct and there's just a lot to it. Again, um, greenhouse is good if you're trying to start seeds in the winter time and keep things warm as they germinate. I see that I think that's the growing tower that Cheyenne McMasters has been taking around to some of the schools in the county. And I know they've had great luck with that. Um, that's a really fun way to do it, each individual container. I know that she's had lots of luck with germination and production out of her grow tower. That's a, that is a form of vertical gardening. And vertical gardening is becoming more and more popular, especially, you know, it used to be that, okay, vertical for everybody that doesn't have a lot of room, because you can do vertical gardening, even if you have, if you're living in a condo or an apartment, or, and all you have is a deck, you can put a pot out on the out in, outside in the sunshine and put some sort of a trellis. You can use a formal trellis. You can use cattle panels and put them in, sit in the back of a pot. You can use hog wire. There's all sorts of things that you can do to grow up and take advantage of your vertical space. So if I can back up just a second, when Bill's talking about all the things to plant, 
think it's important for people to understand that there are plants that you plant in the warm season and plants that you do in the cool season. And we're coming up on the warm season. So, and yet it's still too chilly. To me, March is the big teaser month. The skies are great. The temperatures are warm. Like right today, it wasn't really, but, but um, it's like, we'll be right back to 80 degrees in no time. And the nurseries are full of tomatoes and peppers and all the kinds of things that want to grow during the warm season. And it can be confusing and a bit misleading. Trying to plant warm season vegetables in March is taking a huge risk. I know in Cochise County, our average latest freeze used to be April 29th. It's been moved up to April 15th. But even though you think, oh, we're warm for so many days, there's not going to be any more cold. I've been here for 44 years. And in 44 years, I've only seen three years that did not have a surprise freeze in April. There's usually a surprise freeze around Easter sometime. So I always count on that happening rather than hoping that it won't. So just be careful with your frost tender vegetables like your tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, all of the squashes. They, it's like if it breathes 32 degrees out there, they're gonna burn on you. And all that excitement about getting ready for the spring and then planting all these things too early can be very heartbreaking. Um, I remember a long time ago, I learned from Bill Cook. Um, I remember him saying that even if it's very warm outside and, and you can protect the top of your tomato, because there's so many ways of protecting it when it gets cold, if those roots are sitting in a cool soil, they're just, it, the cool soil prevents them from forming, prevents them from getting, from getting vigorous. So they sit in that cool soil and they waste a lot of energy and they'll fall behind a plant that is, you wait to plant in warmer soil. Um, so to me, getting the, getting the seasons right is, is my concern. If you do have a way to keep things warm, then I know lots of people that start things early and plant tomatoes and peppers early, but they have, they're constantly worrying about keeping them warm on the cold nights that, that start to breathe 32 degrees or anything below that. And this sort of transitions to the next question about seeds or starts and really what Bill was saying, as well as what you were saying, Jan, with, you know, if you're starting with seeds, you really need to watch the soil temperature and, and think about the freeze. If you're, if you're buying starts or if you're growing your own starts inside, you, you've got a little more flexibility. So uh, anybody who wants to jump in on seeds or starts and maybe for which plants. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, uh, Jan brought up a really big point there about, about putting your starts out when the time is right. Um, because even if you can keep it from freezing, because you know, most of us terrestrials, we live up here above the earth. But uh, <laughs> you put your jalapenos out now and you religiously cover them every night and all that, they won't <laughs> die, but it'll probably be the end of July or the middle of August before they recover because those roots require warm soil, same as the seed did. Um, but there's a way around this. And we have a couple of YouTube videos if anybody ever wants to check them out, but I'll just give you the quick rundown. If you wanna warm your soil up to plant earlier, roll out, roll out some black plastic mm -hmm. on the ground, warm it up ahead of time. It's amazing what a difference that does make when you put them out. You know, I mean, I've, I've planted uh, chilies into 85 degree soil the first week of May. Hey, Bill, be specific on that. Would you, you roll, and I see Eric shaking his head as well. Um, would you, for the people listening, would you roll out the black plastic? How far ahead of planting? And oh, as early as possible. Okay. You know, prep your beds, get your water. I use uh, tea tape, you know, and I roll out the tea tape, make sure there's no leaks and it works. And I roll out the black plastic as soon as possible. How about Eric, have you used the uh, dark mulches like that in plastic or any other form? Yeah, I use uh, uh, the black six mil row covers. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll roll that out. And, you know, I agree with Jan about greenhouses. I spent thousands of dollars fixing greenhouses <laughs> in this, in this, these high winds and it's almost impossible. Um, so what I've actually done is I've converted a steel building 
and I've bought uh, the wire rack systems that you buy from Home Depot or Lowe's. I put five foot heat mats on them. And then what I do is, is I have a programmable thermostat where I can plant these seeds into the peat cups, the small peat cups. Um, and then I can program it to the optimal germination. So then I'll start my plants on those systems. Then what I'll do is, is I'll roll out that six mil black um, row cover. And then I use a, a flame torch, literally just to poke holes into that into that row cover and then plant the starts directly into that. So I have preheated soil with right. starts that I've done on, uh, on heat mats. Mm -hmm. And that works really well. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's changed the way we've done it. And it solved a lot of greenhouse headaches. Yeah. Well, and the, the, the rolled out the plastic mulch saves water, mm -hmm. saves weeds, um, I mean, it's just, it's pretty good stuff. And it works for just about anything because at least here, plants grow enough that they'll shade it before summer comes on and it gets too hot. So yeah. it's, it's good stuff. Are you yeah. saying you leave the black plastic on during the yeah. growth season when it gets hot? Yeah, I do kind of a similar thing to what Eric's doing. I just cut a hole in the plastic. You know, I'm careful where my water lines are. <laughs> just cut through, cut a hole in the plastic and drop a plant through it. Yeah, and the, the canopy will shade it. And if yep. you're if you're really concerned about it, you can also go over it with a light coating of mulch, of yeah. uh, organic yep. mulch. Yeah, and you could, you know, I have found uh, what really benefits from that method is melons. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. And the other beautiful thing is that things like a cantaloupe mm -hmm. in the mud, if we have a rainy season ever again, Things that lay in the mud and rot, well, on that black plastic, they don't, they don't go south. I mean, they're clean when you pick them. <laughs> you know, right. On the subject of mulching, you know, like uh, something Eric pointed out, a way to keep it cooler is to put a light colored mulch on. Yep. That's a lot of people don't think when they're out mulching their garden, the book says straw, they use straw. Um, but the color of your mulch will influence your soil temperature a lot, you know, greatly. So that's a, a real good point. I hope people are taking notes because that's a real important one there. And I just I just jumped in the slides to a picture of row cover, which Eric had mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, for people who don't know about row cover, I, I'm a big fan of it. It's just a light sort of gauzy material and it it keeps the keeps things warmer during the winter and it keeps things cooler during the summer and then it also can help with pests and Eric's going to talk some about watering and also how he uses row cover in that so managing watering is a challenge here in the desert let's talk about that and, and just one point the row covers that I use um, um, I, I think that's the agribond that you showed there I use a it's a six mil woven material that's uh, that's actually black, and it's really super heavy, and it um, you um, you poke it into the ground with staples, and um, and, and it stays down pretty well. Um, so as far as the watering systems we used, I, I so I've grown crops in various parts of the United States, and you know I've grown them in the southeast of uh, the southeast where literally you could just put seeds in the ground and they would sprout. And I've grown things in the Midwest where you had unlimited uh, water opportunities. And then when I started growing in Arizona, I'll be quite frank, the first couple of years uh, were a complete bust. And it was mainly because I wasn't getting um, adequate water into the plants. Um, the way I, I approach um, the watering systems out on our farm um, for, our, for our, um, our produce operation is I use different types of applications based on what type of crop I'm, I'm planting. So I have what I call a high rotation garden. Um, and what I do is I break them into uh, to, uh, 50 by 50 foot plots. This is where I grow a lot of the greens. This is where I, I grow a lot of the high turnover crops. So a lot of people will grow like um, this time of year, beets or radishes or romaine lettuces, things of that nature, things that you're going to you're going to turn over this, uh, this crop probably three, four times within the year. I use 
uh, mostly an, over, an overhead sprinkler system for that. And what I use are um, uh, like the pop-up sprinklers that you would find um, in a yard, but in a 50 by 50 plot, let's say, I'll have one right smack in the middle and then I'll have them all the way in the corners and then I'll have them between the corners so that when you, when you irrigate, and I've got these set up on timers. Um, so I've got eight, I would have four, four channels on a 50 by 50. The spray from one sprinkler will overlap the sprays from the other so that you get a thorough coating of this water, trying to achieve about an anchor inch of water um, so that you, know, you properly saturate that, that soil for that type of crop. Um, the other type of irrigation that I use is, is the drip tape, like you see here in the picture. And I have two different methods for the drip tape. I have one where I'm above ground drip tape and I'm using the application exactly as you see here. So you've got a lettuce crop. That lettuce crop would be in my overhead irrigation area, but I would also have drip tape that runs between those plants, mainly because in winds like we have right now, if you're not irrigating in the middle of the night, which is dangerous when it's this cool, um, the chances of you getting adequate coverage on that plant with these high 25 mile an hour winds is, is practically impossible. So I use this type of tape to augment that. The other application I use for this type of drip tape is an underground application with the row cover. So I'll actually have a grid system set up with the um, underground drip tape running in the row underground and then covered over with the, um, the six mil uh, row cover. And I find that it, it I use less water. Um, the, the row cover keeps the ground uh, saturated underneath. And then as the soil temperature heats up and heats up, the transpiration rates on the plants increase, evaporation is controlled somewhat by the row cover, but it still exists. Then I use kind of a feel method where I, I um, you know, I, like for instance, in August, um, summer squash, I could irrigate those for two hours in the morning and by five o'clock at night, they're already wilting. So you have to develop kind of a feel for your temperature, your microclimate, and understand what it is that your plants need. Incidentally, when using this type of, row, um, this type of um, drip line, I also have fertilizer injectors where I can inject liquid fertilizer directly into these lines. And as these plants, their root systems grow down around these, these uh, drip lines, um, you can also get that nutrient directly into the plant. And I've, I've had really good results with the fertilizer injectors. Now, don't be afraid by that, by that because you can go online to like a dripworks.com or a dripdepot.com and you can buy these whole kits for less than $100. Um, that'll put um, liquid fertilizer directly <clears throat> on your plants. If you want them organic, which is what we do, um, you can just uh, um, go with the uh, liquid organic fertilizer and you know, the, it's, it's just a, it's a good growing system and it limits the amount of water loss that you would experience. Right. Anybody yeah. doing anything with rainwater harvesting or other thoughts on watering? Actually, we're doing a rainwater system over at the county annex, which is where we have our demonstration gardens. And uh, this is a perfect moment to mention like uh, Eric was saying the water efficiency for your garden with that uh, flat soaker. I've done some side-by-side -side comparisons here at my own place when I started using it 12, 13 years ago. And uh, I've actually, on the average, you know, the standard garden vegetables, corn, beans, all that, I've actually pulled off a garden on like 1.75 acre feet, you know, so uh, 1.75 inches of, or, you know, or feet of precipitation, which is about a third of what you would use by the standard method of, of watering in um, furrows. So where I'm going with this is that with rainwater harvesting, you need to really make efficient use of that water and uh, drip 
particularly the drip tape for garden vegetables is the best way that I know. And particularly one of the, one of the drawbacks to the soaker is that hard water will yeah. up deposits and plug it eventually. Rainwater is about as soft as it gets. So it's almost like a match made in heaven. And the low pressure aspect, you know, because the, the drip tape, uh, depending on the brand, you have a maximum pressure anywhere from eight to 15 PSI. Found that if you buy the 15 mil, you know, the heavier gauge material, and if you keep your pressure below eight, um, and I've used it, I've actually used it on gravity flow stuff as low as two, it lasts a whole lot longer with the lower pressures. But it's just, it's like I say, it's a match made in heaven. You know, the water is soft, drip tape's efficient, um, and low pressure. So. Bill, for everybody looking at Eric, the picture that's on the screen now, is that material that's irrigating a drip tape? Yes. Uh, let me see, kind of looks like it. Yeah, the flat soaker hose. So drip um, tape is really cool because it has a, doesn't it have a laser punctured hole every every so many inches through that whole piece of tape? Well, actually what it is when they, when they uh, like weld it together, it starts out as a flat piece and they weld a seam down the middle and every so far they weld a zigzag opening. Okay, so there's an opening every so often in that drip tape. Yeah, yeah, and, and you can buy it in every six inches, eight inches, 12. There you go. So I, really, so I for people that are new and they, do, they don't understand the concept of it, that means that that way you could plant a lettuce, which you see here or whatever pepper. So if you're planting them every six inches or every 12 inches or every 18 inches, you buy the drip tape that matches that. So yeah. that there is a watering out of that tape for every plant. And yeah. well, I think that's important for them to know. And I saw that Karen put up a little chat thing and she said, drip irrigation is your key to success. I think mm -hmm. that's such a great line because for people, I'm, I know that people say, well, I'm just going to hand water and, and I'm going to connect with my plants and I'm going to use the garden hose, et cetera. You just, for some reason, can't ever get enough water to the bottom of those roots when you're watering an entire garden. Yeah. And whether you use drip tape or other forms of drip irrigation, I think it sounds like all three of us are huge proponents of getting some sort of drip irrigation into your garden. It really will, it's, um, if you if you're just if you say you're just going to hand water, it's going to kind of set you up for some for some failures and yeah. some heartbreak. Yeah. And I think drip is not as hard as people think. Once you get going, it's not. You know, you don't have to have a huge garden or a farm. I mean, you can do no. drip on a little area. Little and for me, I do. I like I like the hand watering, like you said. To I feel closer to my garden, but it's just so hot here that. If you miss one day or even, I don't know if you all water more than once a day, it, stuff dies fast. It does. And it's not, it's not forgiving. And it's like, you know, all of us have had that moment where we say, oh, I got to get to work. Oh, gosh, or I've got an appointment at nine. Okay, I'll water that when I get home. And by the time you get home, many times those veggies haven't waited on you and they're now stressed. And so the ir irrigation as Karen said, I think a lot of people are scared of irrigation. They think it's a some big mystery. Um, everybody talks about, oh, it's very high maintenance. You've got so many problems. There's a little bit of maintenance with irrigation, but one thing I will promise, the pros always outweigh the cons on an irrigation system. It, it really does make a huge difference in the amount of water that you use, the amount of time that you use, and the way your plants perform. There's just something about a drip system that can put the water concentrated on the roots where those roots need it, rather than taking a chance on just a, a wide span watering. You know, there, there's a lot of people, you know, probably listening tonight that um, are, and rightly so, sold on drip irrigation. Uh, as somebody who just, saw it years ago and decided to start playing with it and learned everything the hard way. There's just a couple of real important things before you go to the store and start buying stuff. Yeah. Know your soil type, your soil texture. Um, like with the tea tape, the, the flat soaker, it comes in a high flow and it comes in a low flow. 
And more importantly, even than the spacing of your plants in the garden is, is if you've got clay soil and you put the high flow, water's gonna run everywhere before it penetrates. Mm -hmm. If you've got sandy soil and you put on the low flow, you're gonna get one tiny wet spot. So you do have to match your materials, you know, to the application they're intended for. And also filtration, yes. if you're gonna give drip a try, filter it and read, read the instructions that come with these materials because like that flat soaker requires uh, a 200 mesh screen, which most people don't have on their garden um, and right side up, but you know, research it, find out what the pressure regulator, which, which pressure regulator you need, how many gallons per hour you're gonna be using, uh, match parts because I've seen so many people go down to the big box store, grab a bunch of stuff off of a shelf and wind up with a disaster on their hands. And they wind up calling somebody and complaining that uh, drip, drip doesn't work, it's no good. I've heard that from a lot of people and it's always that situation, misapplication of materials. So when you're shopping, look at the pressure because I've seen people go to the big box and buy emitters and soaker and, and the only pressure regulator on the shelf and uh, they bought a 25 PSI pressure regulator for something that needed 15, you know, research, study. There are important factors and there's a lot of good, good information out there, so. And we do have a um, good uh, resource on getting started with drip irrigation, I think from Cooperative Extension, that there's a link in the chat, but we'll also send that to people. So a couple mm -hmm. people asked, will, will we be able to get these resources? We'll be sending a recording of this along with all of the resources we've mentioned, plus a few things. So we have about um, 10 minutes left. I wanna, if anyone has questions, um, put them into the Q&A or chat. But then I wanna just go around and have each one of you talk about just something that's, that's one of your favorite tips or a trick for people getting started or just some little thing that you'd like to share that you think will be useful for people. And my, mine is gonna be Agribon. I love growing undercover. And whether it's what you see in this picture in the lower right-hand corner, I grow all of my greens under Agribon. And if I do my successions right, I, I have lettuce 12 months a year. So it is, it is possible. You have to watch when you plant as far as temperature, but a lot of, you know, a lot of things, if once you get it germinated, you can keep growing even in the heat of the summer. And Agribon is one of the things that makes that work for me. Helps a lot with pests. It keeps moisture in. Um, so this is just right on the ground with, I've just got rocks on the edge of it. Um, I've also done Agribon over low hoops for bigger plants. Um, and that's that's something that for me has just really made my um, my growing so much better. So I don't want to know who wants to go next, but just anything you'd like to share. Well, one, one thing I would add to um, Bill's comments about um, uh, setting up the drip system um, and the filtration. Um, I learned filtration the hard way because I had invested in some very nice timers because I believe in automation. And I would encourage you that if you ever want to go on vacation or you ever want to uh, uh, be away from your garden for a couple of days to invest in some timers and timers don't necessarily have to be expensive. Um, I use um, an orbit product that costs about it's a four channel orbit. It costs about one hundred dollars. Um, you have to add a couple more valves because they have external valves. But the key thing that I would stress is when you put that filtration in and absolutely put that filtration in, because no matter how clean you think your water is, it'll plug up valves, it'll plug up uh, emitters. Put that filtration between the water source and that timer and then into your system because those valves on the timers have very small tolerances and the slightest particulate gets in there and you'll be buying new timers, so.
Yeah, very good point. I, I absolutely agree with using the filters. There, you know, it's just an, an extra little piece that you buy that you can slip into the into this setup. Um, and I agree with you on if you're going to be away at all. And, and I know that you're using a really nice timer in the Discovery Gardens over at the university here. Um, we even we even use the little thirty five and forty dollar timers that work just fine for the smaller gardens. So you're not having to invest a lot of money. Big thing is checking the batteries. We make sure that we get those batteries checked at least every 30 days so that we don't count on something and then it, it poops out on us. Um, I, and I, I think it would be fun if we talked about if we were gonna go out and plant something this coming weekend, what would we put in the ground this weekend? Or the other thing is when it gets warm enough, What's everybody's favorite tomato to put in the ground? And if mm. you can hold off until after the freeze is over, putting tomatoes out, what's your favorite? I know some people criticize it. My favorite is the Sweet One Million or the Sweet One Hundred. They are the little bitty tomatoes that are about the size of the end of your thumb. I love them. They never make it to my kitchen because even my husband, who's not a gardener, will walk through the garden and just eat his way through if I have a Sweet One Hundred tomato planted here and there. Um, they're the little bitty tomatoes. It's an indeterminate vine, uh, difference between indeterminate and determinate. I think that's important, especially, well, I'm kind of talking in a circle here, but if you're going to plant in containers, know that tomatoes come in determinate plants, which um, don't get as long and viney. They're a little more stocky in their, in their structure. And so they take to a container quite well. You'll probably still need to support them a little bit, but you don't need a huge cage and lots of room for them to vine. Um, determinants also give, they have a more, as they say, determined production time. So they don't produce all season long. So it's many of them you have to pick at once, but anyway, determinant indeterminate tomatoes are the kinds that that vine on and on and on and they just have an ongoing production season so know which tomato you're getting if you're especially if you're going to plant in a container so that you know how much room to allow but that would be my favorite thing to plant if i could only plant one thing and i'd love to hear that from eric and bill if you could only plant one thing what would you plant <laughs> what's your favorite you know my favorite i i love this time of year beets i i I actually started, um, I've, I've started them in my grow room, that little rack system I told you about. They're mm -hmm. about, mm, the, the tops are probably about three inches tall. And I think that I'm going to start putting them in this week. Very nice. Very nice. And, and what, okay, so you plant in a, again, you don't want to plant a tomato this weekend, but if you were planting this weekend for the first time, you would do beets, you're saying. Yeah, the, this is the right time for for beets for me. Okay. Um, my farm's at um, forty two hundred feet, uh -huh. so we can actually frost into May, and so I'm still pretty much in the colder weather things. What would you plant, Bill? What would you do this weekend? Well, oh, this weekend. Well, if you were a first time gardener and you were here, and you said I I've got some things ready. I've either got some pots or well, I've got soil prepped, but I want to put something in because I'm itching. I want to go do it. <laughs> what would you plant? Well. I have to. I have to say, my I, I'm going with Eric on the beets. There you go. <laughs> I I can never get too many, and there's so many different kinds of beets. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and and I like the tops. As yeah, much. me too. I hear that over and over from people who plant beets for the first time. They say, "I never knew how much fun they were, how productive they could be, yeah. and how yummy they are." A lot of people that move here don't think you can do beets in the ground. So yes. it's, it's kind of a fun surprise to learn about. Yeah, yeah, yeah it sure is. Um, oh, and, and I'm, I'm going to leave you with a parting favorite thing I ever learned about gardening here. And that's companion planting. Yes, sir. Companion planting. You can use the same ground three ways, like the three sisters system. Mm -hmm. um, you can provide an egg laying space for ladybugs by leaving some of that bolting lettuce out there or by not pulling a couple of sow thistles. You know, figure out where, where your preferred predator lays its eggs and give them that. Um, giant sunflowers, those draw in every darn predatory wasp in the county, you know. My, I found that my corn doesn't blow over as easy if it's got a, a bean anchoring it. Um, 
we even have this, the sacrificial companions. I put a little bit of corn and it doesn't matter whatever surplus seed I have close to the cucumbers and let the cucumber beetles go eat corn silk instead of cucumber vines and plant beans between your cucumbers, between your beans, between your cucumbers and you'll You'll stop the cucumber beetle. You won't get rid of them. You'll just corral them in one location. Um, I mean, there's just so much to companion planting that it's it's like an entire subject. You know, one basic in companion planting for people that are new, if you're planting a small garden, add marigolds. Yeah, marigolds will help draw the pollinators. But the thing they have found that the top of the marigold emits a scent that a lot of your pests do not like. Like aphids don't like the scent of marigolds. And mm -hmm. so the top of the flower helps repel some of your pests, but also the roots of a marigold will nematodes. also help um, repel the root, not nematodes that can attack yeah. you to the plants. So um, plus the fact, I think adding vegetables or adding flowers to your veggie garden makes it beautiful. It adds that extra color while you're waiting on a lot of the blooms to come in. So there are two huge reasons to plant marigolds with your, with your veggies. And Bill mentioned the three sisters. Some people don't know what three sisters is. It's an old concept developed by the Native Americans. So three sisters are, is a combination of three plants that help each other. So first is corn. Corn grows upright. The second one is beans. You plant beans at the base of your corn and the beans use the corn as their support to, tw to twine up. But the other thing the beans do is beans are called legumes. That's L-E-G-U-M-E. -E. And anything that produces a bean is called a legume and that has the ability to fix nitrogen into the soil. It's kind of a long scientific process about the different, the different nematodes and the different mycorrhizae and all that on the roots. But let's make it simple and say that legumes have the ability to take nitrogen gas out of the air and fix nitrogen into the soil. The third sister is squash. So you plant squash with your beans and your corn and the squash has the big leaves which go out and those leaves help keep moisture in the soil, keep the soil a little bit cooler. And so the three of them help one another. Fun concept and a great way to plant. Companion planting is really a lot of fun and very successful. Excellent. Oh, can I add one more thing? Yes. Basil. If you can plant basil through your garden as well, basil also has a wonderful repellent quality to it because it is so scented that a lot of your common pests like the aphids and the white flies that might be coming in don't like it. And, and so basil every now and then will help be a repellent as well. Hornworms. It keeps, it helps keep hornworms away. I plant, I plant a basil between every tomato going down the row. There you go. And I've also heard the myth that when you plant basil with your tomatoes, really helps enhance the flavor of the tomato. Do you believe that, Bill? Well, I'm afraid to plant mint anywhere I don't want mint for the rest of the <laughs> Which well, would, you know. <laughs> but I mean, do you think basil helps infuse flavor into, into tomatoes? I don't know. I'm just happy that I, since I started doing that, I've not seen a hornworm. There you go. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. And hornworms on your tomatoes, the best way you can control them is you just go out every morning and you look because a hornworm will take, take those tomato plants down in an evening. So if you go out and you notice that leaves are starting to disappear on the top of your tomato plant, look at the bottom, look at the top of your soil. And sometimes you can see their little droppings. They're about the, maybe the size of a third of a green pea a quarter of a green pea. And that's how I find them first as I see the droppings around the tomato plant. Then I look carefully and I go, uh oh, I'm losing, I've lost two or three different leaves. What you have to do is stare at that tomato plant, but you have to, it's weird. You have to relax your eye and just look around because those, those hornworms will blend right into that plant. But just relax your eyes, look around and all of a sudden you'll see them. You'll see those guys and just pick them off. That is your very best way to control your hornworms. They also can, they will glow with the black light. If you, if you go, if you go in your garden at night, I'm always afraid of snakes, but at our house, we take turns. So when we see that there's leaves eaten, 
we we take turns looking for them because sometimes it's that thing where you need a different set of eyes but if you you're right if you see those leaves gone they're there and your whole plant's going to be gone if you don't get on it so and i totally forgot that trick about the black light it <laughs> works a lot of people use it and you can buy a cheap little black light flashlight for probably under 10 bucks like at ace ace hardware mm -hmm. or some of those mm -hmm. kind of places mm -hmm. forgot that trick thank you karen that's a good one Okay, we are winding down on our hour, and I just want to um, uh, do a few housekeeping things. And again, we will be sending a copy of this and resources to everyone. Um, I want to really thank our panelists. This has been great. Um, we would we would love to do another one of these on other topics. So there's an evaluation at the end of this. If you have ideas for topics, um, please let us know. We also have um, two more webinars coming up this month. Next week, we have a pop-up book club discussion of the book Coming Home to Eat by Gary Nabham. Um, many of you already signed up for that, but you're also, you're invited even if you didn't finish the book, because we'll also be talking about eating local as a broader topic. There was a question in the Q&A tonight about, for people who, who don't want to have their own garden, what are options for local food? And I mentioned in the Q&A on Eat Local Cochise.org, we have a directory of local farmers markets and local farms in different ways to access that food. Um, so check that out. Um, two weeks from tonight, we have Gary Nabhound is going to um, be here to guest speak on Zoom. And then over the rest of the summer, we're going to be doing more webinars on gardening as well as preserving food, um, foraging, and just preparing food. You know, what do you what do you what do you do with eggplant and that kind of thing? Um, there are tons of resources at your local library, so make sure to check those out. And I don't know if, if um, you all have favorite resources, but I know one that we really depend on is the Sunset um, Western Garden book. There are copies of that in all of our libraries, so that's a really good resource. And just lots of other um, books that have been put in our libraries as a part of this program. All our contact information is here. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and the web. And um, I will um, get you information for our panelists as well um, in the follow-up email. So any closing thoughts from, from any of you before we leave, panelists? Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, get out get there and try. And don't, don't be afraid to fail. I yeah, think, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> no, you know, a lot of times it, I always remind people that if you don't have any failures, you're not really gardening. You okay. know, a lot of it's trial and error. So don't be afraid to experiment. And um, as Karen said, that Sunset Western Garden book, there's several editions out. Uh, the ones you held up is just one of them. They all have kind of different covers, but that's a wonderful resource. Um, you can also find great resources if you go to, U of A has a wonderful publication site with lots and lots of articles. And so if you go to arizona.edu forward slash pubs, P-U-B-S, that stands for publications, it will bring up a screen. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little bar that says search. So you can search growing tomatoes, growing squash, doing vegetables, whatever. And you can bring up lots and lots of research and science-based articles there on about anything you want to learn about. The other thing is you saw that little, I think the planting guide is a very, very interesting thing. Can you go back to that, Karen? There is a great publication on the Arizona Pubs site. It's the most requested publication of all, and it's called the 10 Steps to Successful Vegetable Gardening. This is one of the pages out of it. This is really great because you can go to find your elevation and then it is grouped by elevations and then it will tell you the name of the vegetable and then when is a good time to plant it. Because that, that's probably one of the most common questions we receive also is what can I plant and when? And this insert from the publication 10 Steps to Successful Vegetable Gardening will really give you a good guide. You don't have to stick to it exactly, but it's a great concept. It's a great place to help you get started. So um, I wish I knew that publication number. It's because you can also search by numbers. It's on the front of it. Give the front of that page, Karen. It's up in the upper left-hand corner. 
I don't have it in front of me, but I think we put it in the chat and we will also email that in the follow up email and also um, the videos that Bill mentioned are excellent. And then one other great resource is um, on the Cochise County Cooperative Extension, there's a Ask a Master Gardener link that we will also include. And we really appreciate all of the um, all of the support from Extension as well as the Master Gardeners. So um, that is great advice to just, just go out and try it. Um, I read that in the last year, over 16 million new gardens have been started. And a lot of that is because of COVID and both, both the need for food, um, thinking about food security, and also just people wanting to get outside and do something productive. And it is truly, we are all, um, I was talking to Eric before we got on, we're all doing trial and error and seeing what works. And there's no, you know, there's no garden that's perfect and just get out there and try it and have fun and grow stuff you like to eat would be another. Can I make one more comment, Karen? I know I'm going long. I don't no, mean go. to, but no, we go. could do a whole talk just on all the aspects of why gardening is so healthy for you. It is not only good for eating good fresh vegetables because of they, it's research, research has shown that if you will grow your own, Many times it helps you form healthier eating habits. And then you're also a lot more likely to try a variety of different vegetables. But in addition to eating healthy, being out in nature, so good for stress level, so good for um, different things. Like they have found that if they will send somebody out in nature and do gardening, it will lower your blood pressure. It helps control diabetes. It's fabulous for your physiology of your body. Um, they did studies, you know, your cortisol's rise when you are stressed and they have found that if you will go out and garden and be in nature those cortisol levels will come down literally scientifically proven come down within an hour or two so get out there and garden it's so good for you it's one of the healthiest things you can do for your your mind and your body oh and the other thing i want to say a lot of times people get out there and they and they hurt and they go oh this muscle hurts my back hurts my legs are sore there's a gardening fitness so be prepared for that. Even if you work out, if you're a runner, a walker, or whatever, there's a certain gardening fitness that you have to acquire. Um, you're going to use muscles you don't ordinarily use. You're going to use stretching movements, and you will acquire a flexibility and an endurance and build muscles that you didn't even know you had. So the first couple of weeks, if you're kind of hurting from the activity, just realize you're going to get there. Within a couple of weeks, all those pieces of your body are going to get used to it, and they're going to start working with you. So don't be afraid to hurt a little bit. Excellent advice. So happy growing, everyone. We, we hope to have more contact with you. There was a question in the Q&A about will you be getting notifications for future meetings? If you um, asked for that on the sign up, you will absolutely get that. And just if you didn't get the email for this or you are having issues, make sure you check with your in your spam folder because sometimes that's a problem. But um, we appreciate everybody being here and especially appreciate our, our panelists and all the good work they do every day and get out there and grow some food, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.